I just feel like I have on more jewelry here. I've got <laughs> my beads. Welcome to our uh, workshop this afternoon. And I have a couple announcements before we get started. Since we're videotaping, we ask that cell phones are off or on vibrate. And the textbooks you need to leave here uh, because we'll be using them again for additional workshops. But this one I really do need to talk to you about for just a minute. Um, when we're going through here, a lot of this will seem uh, a lot of this new material will seem very easy to you. You'll say, well, this is general information. I can teach this. This isn't anything that requires any uh, special background or special information. But there may be some things that we talk about and do today that you think, well, this is just not my area of expertise. I am not comfortable uh, with all this library information. And I would like to have the library staff help teach that part. And um, our boss over in the library, Eileen Schweitzer, is very good about working with the faculty. She likes to find an opportunity to work with the faculty. So if you... Um, get to a point in here where you're thinking, you know, I, I really would rather have the library staff teach this part of this lesson. Um, just make a little note and email Sharon and let her know what part you would like to have the library help with. And then we're going to have a meeting, um, Sharon and, and Norm and Eileen and probably, I guess I'll be included, and we'll talk about what we can do to have the library staff help you out. So just let her know. Um, what I'm doing today, I'm only going through, through the part of this course that is the uh, research part of the course. This is a combination of uh, information literacy research skills uh, combined with Microsoft Office. And I'm not covering Microsoft Office in here because you guys probably know more about it than I do. So. Uh, this is just the information literacy part. That is the explanation for why you only have half of the uh, lesson plans here in your packet. Um, and you'll notice that you, this just goes through week seven. And you'll notice there's no week five at all here because that was the week that we worked exclusively on Excel. So I didn't bother to include that one. So I've only given you the ones that have something to do with the um, research part of the course. So I've been teaching this class this summer, an eight-week course, and we've gotten through the book, the information literacy book, which is the um, brown and gray book, tan and gray book. We got through that book uh, in four weeks. So we had plenty of time to uh, work on bo in, through both of these books. We are not running out of time, so it has worked out well. Hmm, where did I put my books? Okay, here they are. Do you need them? Um, so I was worried that it wouldn't be possible to do both parts of this, you know, adding so much information in about research skills and still cover Microsoft Office, but they don't go in depth as much with the Office book as the current one does, and there really did turn out to be plenty of time to do both of these in this course. We even have a little time left over at the end. So let me, what I'm going to do today, I'm just going to go through my PowerPoint uh, slides that I do for the students each week. And so I'm just kind of showing you what I did with them. So that's what you're looking at here. And I'm going to let you do the exercises that they do so that you'll have some idea of what's going on. And I know you know a lot of this stuff, so I'm not insulting your intelligence. But this is what we do in class, just so you can have some idea about what's going on. Uh, what is information literacy? Well, it's the ability to locate, evaluate, organize, and communicate information. And that definition comes right out of the book. Uh, librarians were once the gatekeepers of information. And back in the good old days, um, we actually had a great deal of control over, what, over the information that people used. We chose the books for the library. Uh, even when uh, databases came along on CD-ROMs, we could choose the CD-ROM. We really had control over information. But of course, with the internet, um, 
we have absolutely no control over information and so the end users themselves have to be the people that know what to look for and be able to evaluate information and decide what's useful and what's not. So we're all trying to change our focus away from selection to education. So that's what this kind of course does. It helps the students uh, select valuable information and know what's good and what's not. Uh, the sources that are covered are books, periodicals, and online sources and Microsoft Office will be taught to organize and communicate the information so as you see those are two important parts of information literacy. Um, then I go over the class syllabus of course. Come to class, uh, do your homework, take notes, the usual. But I do want to tell you all that there are two textbooks on reserve in the library. Both of these are in the library. So if they have any trouble getting their books at the beginning of the semester, they are there on reserve. But because they cannot be taken out of the library, there's also a copy of them over in the academic computer lab because they have to have this at the computer. So if they um, don't have their books for any reason, they can use those textbooks over in the academic computer lab and the library. And then um, what we did was we had the students select a topic that they would research throughout the course. And at the end, uh, in a 16-week course, I would have them create a PowerPoint uh, slideshow, a Wikipedia article, and a web page. But during the eight-week course, because we are so short of homework time, we, I mean, we had plenty of time to do everything in class, but because they are so pressed for time, uh, I've had them choose between these three and just do one of them. And there is no formal written paper. We're going to leave that for the English teachers, but they um, do have to collect plenty of information in order to create a good PowerPoint Wikipedia page or Wikipedia article or web page. And then I originally hoped to have them do a participation journal, but to be perfectly honest, we ran out of class time every single day, so we never actually did that. So this tells them about the participation journal, but um, I'll try that again maybe in the fall, but it didn't, we just never quite got around to it. We always ran over. Um, this is where we did introductions. This is me, I'm Lynn Gallagher. And I tell them that it's a very feminine name, gal forward, gal backward, and her at the end. And it's from the old Irish gal hobar, and it means foreign helper. But the kind of help that they gave was military help, so really it's a mercenary. But it sounds so much friendlier to say a helper. So then I say, what's your name, and tell me something about yourself. So do you want to just tell me so what your name is and tell me something about yourself? Anything. Good. Hi, my name is Gwen Banks, and I teach at Tab High School. I am a dual enrollment teacher at Tab High School, and I'm also the adjunct uh, teacher here. And I have been teaching at the Southeast Center for the last three years. Now. So I forget, I was here full time for 100 years. <laughs> Oh, a yoga teacher. Oh, my goodness. Well, that's interesting. All right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, I bet. Yeah. And we just had a person leave to become a personal trainer. Um, so people do go on to better jobs once they leave here. So that's nice. Um, then we cover selecting a topic. And um, what I do is I have them re read page 23 and 24 in Taylor, which tells them how to choose a topic. So. Um, that's just reading right out of the book. But when I have them choose a topic, I make sure that they choose something that is not broad and that already doesn't have a complete Wikipedia article. Because if they're going to write a Wikipedia article, they can't write it on something where there's an article in there already. And I had some very good um, article, I mean, very good topic choices with this class. One person chose the Hampton Coliseum. Um, and he has done a, an interview with, I think his name is Andy Greenwald, the person that ran the Hampton Coliseum for so many years. 
And uh, the student also found some articles that dated back all the way to the 1970s when they just finished building the Coliseum. So that was a good topic. Um, someone also chose Fort Wool, the um, old ruins that are sitting off of Fort Monroe as a topic. That turned out to be a good topic. One woman was on the ship, I think it's called the Vulcan, that was the first ship where women in the Navy actually were on the ship other than um, hospital ships. These, this was the first one that had women on it. So that worked out very well. So there were some good topics and they did narrow them down. So it worked out very well. So we do spend some time trying to make sure we have just the right topic because uh, it's something that they're going to be working with all semester. Then we start talking about find the information. Um, if you will look in this book, on almost every page in this book, uh, well, almost every chapter in this book, you will find a little uh, diagram. I should have marked it. I say that and now I can't find it. Okay, here, here's one on page 23. There's a little diagram here that shows you the steps in research. And first you define the need, so that's where we uh, decided on the topic. Then find the information. So I am on step two right here, find the information. And as you go through this book, you'll see that they tell you which step of the research steps here you are uh, learning about. So each chapter is either define the need or find the information or evaluate the information or organize the information or communicate the information. So we start with find the information and we talk about lo locating a book on your topic. And these are the three, uh, well actually I have four here, different sources that we look at in class in order to find a book on the topic. So if you would like to pull out, let's see, Oh, actually, let me tell you first, we have the topic selection form, and um, we use this to go through and look at these various um, online sources and try to find out if there are books on their particular topic, because they may have found a good topic, but then there's just absolutely nothing there. Uh, to help them. So what I would like for you to do is just kind of think of a topic that you're interested in and then, is everybody's computer on? Yes, good. Let's go to um, Internet Explorer and just have a look at the TNCC catalog and at WorldCat. Okay, so we're at the Thomas Nelson site, so we can start right here. Is everybody with me? Okay. And we will go to Learning Resources, which is right here, and then click on Library. And that is where we will uh, go to use the TNCC catalog and WorldCat. So um, the first thing I'll show you is the Thomas Nelson catalog, and you may have used this many times, but I'll just pull it up here uh, for the purposes of our videotape here, uh, in case someone is not familiar with it. So this is the Thomas Nelson catalog. And throughout this um, course, this eight-week course, I have been using polar bears as an example. Polar bears and global warming. I think I'll do uh, global warming <coughs> and do a search. Notice I can search it by keyword or I can search it by subject. I can search it many different ways. Um, when we move on a little bit from this, in a few minutes we'll talk about the difference between keyword searching and um, controlled vocabulary searching. Uh, the keyword search, of course, is a keyword search. Controlled vocabulary searching is a subject search. So this kind of ties in what, with what we're going to talk about in just a few minutes, but don't worry about it now. We'll just work with the keyword search. We'll search on global warming. Notice that when you're over here that you can search the Thomas Nelson catalog or any of the community college catalogs or all of them at the same time if you want to do that. So uh, if they don't find anything at the Thomas Nelson catalog, they can always search um, all community colleges. 
and then just hit the go button and your results will show up here hopefully did I get the go button yes I did okay um, if they can't find anything here at Thomas Nelson we do have an interlibrary loan service and there is an interlibrary loan form in your packet uh, so you can kind of peek through there and find it the it says Thomas Nelson Community College Interlibrary Loan Request Form. And um, I encourage the students to go ahead and request things through interlibrary loan. If their topic is small enough, it's probably not likely that there'll be a whole lot in our library here. And they will have to find information from other libraries. But we do have an interlibrary loan service, so if they'll fill out this form and take it over to the library and ask the librarian to request the information for them, we would be glad to do it. If the item is available in a Virginia library, there is usually absolutely no charge. And so, of course, we don't charge the students. If it's something that is available only in out-of-state libraries, uh, and occasionally that happens, we try to find a library that does not charge. But if the library charges us, then we have to pass the charge along to them. But in most cases, with resources like UVA and Virginia Tech and ODU and William and Mary, in most cases, we do not have to charge for an interlibrary loan. But I do encourage them to use that service. This is our results screen for global warming. And of course, it gives us the author, the title of the book, the copyright year. And I do point out to them that copyright year is very important. Uh, it is more important in some subject areas, such as health, for example, medicine, than it is in other subject areas like history or literature, but you should always be aware of it. Uh, here is the call number that they need, and this is the Library of Congress call number right here. It says, Campus Thomas Nelson Hampton owned out. We own one copy. No copies are checked out, so that, that means that it is here uh, on the shelves. Now, if they need the full cataloging information, they click on the button right here in front of the uh, entry, and that will open up the full cataloging. Well, let me click here just to make sure I've got it. And this is where they can find the publisher and the place of publication. Uh, on this line right here because it is not on that first result screen. So I have them go through and I have them see if there's anything in the Thomas Nelson catalog. Um, also, I want to show you WorldCat. Does anybody have any questions about the Thomas Nelson catalog? Okay, I'm going to go back to our library page right here. And there's something right here called WorldCat. So this is where I'm going to click this time here on WorldCat. And WorldCat is shared cataloging of all, well not, well of all the large and medium-sized libraries in the United States and some libraries outside of the United States too. So um, when you enter WorldCat, you're in the basic search right here. If you want more control over your search, you can go to advanced search. But I'm going to just work right here and do, um, actually, I'm going to go to advanced search because, for one thing, WorldCat is huge. If it has all the books of all the libraries, you're going to find so much that you almost have to worry about narrowing things down. So I'm going to go to advanced search and switch it over to subject subject right here. Rather than a keyword search, I'll do it a subject search or controlled vocabulary search as we're going to start calling it in a little while. Um, and type my topic in global warming and then hit the search button. Now notice I can limit it to books. I can limit it to English language. I can limit it to a year. So there are a lot of things I can do here, but I'm just going to make it very easy and just search on global warming. And then I will get my um, results screen back. And the order that these results are in is by 
how many libraries actually own the particular book. So this book, well, this isn't a book. This is um, a DVD. So let's look at this one, An Inconvenient Truth. It is owned by this many libraries worldwide. So you'll see that the number of libraries keeps going down here. So it's in order by how many people own it. Um, what you can do is you can click right, well, first of all, I can, if I only want the books, I can click on the books tab and that will eliminate all the visuals and internet sources and that sort of thing. So um, I can do that. Now, if I want to see the cataloging for this, I can click on this link right here. But what's even better is to click on Libraries Worldwide right here. And when I click on this link, it's not only going to show me the cataloging, it's going to show me who owns that book, too. So that's wonderful because if it's a book that we don't own here at Thomas Nelson, I think we do own this one, but if it's a book that we don't own, by clicking on Libraries Worldwide, um, you get a list of who does own the book. Um, here we are right here, Thomas Nelson. So we do own it, but all these other Virginia libraries also own it. So if there's a book a student is looking for, this will tell them where it is. And this is also uh, the, the software that I use, signed on as a staff person, to do interlibrary loans. So this is how I know where to send that request. So this is WorldCat, and it is very helpful when we have those very narrow topics, which we're kind of forcing, hopefully, uh, forcing our students to choose. Um, do you have any questions about WorldCat? I mean, this is a real overview. Uh, sometimes we go to a workshop and they spend three hours just talking about WorldCat, but this is just something that we kind of give them the overview to say, look, if you're looking for something that we're, isn't here, this is where to find it. Um, books in print. I'll go back to books in print and show you that because that's on this sheet too. I am going through this sheet that I have them uh, go through to determine if they're going to be able to find anything on their topic. Now, books in print is one of the Viva databases. And right here you see it says favorite Viva article databases. Viva stands for Virtual Library of Virginia. And um, what it is, is a group of databases that Virginia libraries have purchased jointly. Um, the librarians from all the public, public college and university libraries in Virginia got together and came up with a plan to do group purchasing so that we're a big block and we're spending a lot of money and we can deal better with these vendors and get uh, get a better deal with all the vendors, and it's worked very well. And what it also means is little libraries like Thomas Nelson have many of the same resources that large libraries uh, like Virginia Tech and UVA have, and uh, yet uh, things we couldn't possibly afford if we were doing these purchases on our own. So the Viva databases, there are about 200 of them. These are the ones that are most popular right here. Uh, but we want to look at books in print, and it is not in this list. So what we do is we go to Viva Resources by Title, because we know the title of it. It's books in print. And we just click right there. And then, of course, we have to scroll down until we get to books in print. Books in print right there. I don't know why it doesn't have a dot next to it. Um, and we can do a search here. Actually, I'm going to do a quick search right over there. Global warming, and I'm going to submit. And now what books in print does, it only tell, it's really a tool for people buying books. Uh, and they don't even sell the books through books in print. It just lets librarians and bookstores know what's available and who makes it available. But the reason it helps students is if they're having trouble finding um, a book, they can come here and search books in print, find out what is available, and then they can request it through interlibrary loan. They don't have to actually buy the book. And it does have reviews. Um, I'll just try global warming and the market economy. Uh, some of them have reviews, some of them do not. 
this you'll have a review tab up there if it does, but I'm not seeing one on this one. But this is a this is a, again a huge database, and it is a place to go searching for a book if they haven't found anything locally. We'll try this one with the star and see what it says. But nope. Just trying to find one for you with reviews, but I'm not finding it here right off the bat. But some of them do, so that can be very helpful. See if this one does. Aha, I think it will. Um, title reviews. So this is an inconvenient truth, um, and that one does contain some reviews. So uh, it will let you know whether the book is really worth buying or worth requesting. So this is another place that they can look. And then, of course, I also have them look on Amazon. I'm sure you're all familiar with Amazon, so we won't go to that. But I have them look there. And again, they don't have to buy the book. They can request it through interlibrary loan. So that's our lesson on books uh, and how to find them. And of course, it takes a lot longer for them because they have to go through the entire uh, worksheet. Let's get this going again. Okay, so we did this. We um, did look at the TNCC catalog, WorldCat, Books in Print, and Amazon.com. So then we move on to organize the information. And you'll notice that that is step four here on the little scale that they have in the book. Um, and what we talk about here on this particular day, we're not going to do because you all are very good at this. Um, organizing their files on their flash drive. So we just talk about how to go in there and make uh, folders and put their files in folders. So that's um, what we do in terms of organizing the information. Of course, we'll be back to organize the information many times, but that's how we work it in on this um, first week of class. Uh, find the information. We're back to finding the information again, and this time we're going to talk about how uh, you, how libraries are arranged. So most libraries are either arranged by the Dewey Decimal System or the Library of Congress system. Now the Dewey Decimal System is what you find in the public library and um, also what they're mostly familiar with in high school. It uses numbers for the call numbers. Uh, it was invented by a guy named Melville Dewey and this is how he spelled his name he was kind of an interesting guy because he believed that all English spelling should be done phonetically. So uh, whenever he wrote anything, he wrote it exactly the way it sounded. Uh, so he spelled his own name that way. Um, he, because he invented this himself, he sort of thought about the world of knowledge and how, uh, how knowledge uh, could be organized and kind of came up with a big scheme of organizing knowledge. Uh, but the call numbers in the Dewey Decimal System have gotten very, very long because we've made so much, we've, we've learned so much more, knowledge has uh, increased so much that now those call numbers won't fit on the side of the book in large libraries. They kind of wrap around the book now. So the large libraries have found that that doesn't work very well for them. So large libraries now are using the Library of Congress system. And the Library of Congress system was invented by the, a committee at the Library of Congress, as you could imagine. Uh, the call numbers actually begin with letters of the alphabet, not numbers. And uh, they sort of put their books in the order that they wanted them and said, okay, how can we uh, organize these books? So rather than organizing knowledge, they kind of organized the books. 
uh, in subject areas. And now they've come up with a way using the letters and numbers so that the call numbers fit on the side of a book. So that works out well. Uh, if you look at this handout right here that's right in the front, this is a handout using the Library of Congress classification system. And this is the way, um, do you have that one? There you go. This is the way that our library is arranged and most college libraries. So uh, this is a photocopy of the chart that Scotch taped to the side of one of the shelves in the library. <clears throat> So what this does for you is if you decide that, for example, you want to browse through the art section, let's say the weekend's coming up, you want to do a little painting, not painting your house, but art sort of painting, and you don't know the author of an art book or a painting book, and you don't know the title of a painting book, you just want to browse through the books about painting, you would look on here on this chart and you would find the section where the, the painting books are. So what section of the library would you head to? ND. Okay, so you would find N, which is art, and then you would go down there to painting, ND, and you could just browse through the ND section of the library, and there would be all the books on how to paint there on the shelves. How about uh, photography? Um, it isn't in art the art section, which you might expect. Um, technology. In technology, right, and um, TR. So if you wanted a book on how to take pictures with your digital camera, you could just browse through the shelves in the TR section, and that's where you would find all the photography books. So this is how Library of Congress libraries are arranged. And if you took this chart right here, if you took this piece of paper and started walking up and down the aisles of the library, you would first come to the general works, and then you would come to the philosophy and psychology and religion books, and then the history books. So that's um, what you would do here. Now, in terms of putting books in order, Library of Congress call number order, in class we do a little exercise. Unfortunately, we have a problem because we need, one, we need six people to do this, and we only have four of us, so we're kind of in trouble here. Maybe we can put these up here and see if we can just put them, will they stand up here? Can you, but you can't see it there, can you? Can you see it here? Okay. We'll see if we can just put them up here. Usually I have the students each come up here and volunteer to be a book and have them hold this. And if in a large class, I actually do this with the classes that come into the library. In a large class, I have the rest of the class put the books in order. But my little six-person class, uh, each person had to be a book. And then they had to put themselves in order. So if we're putting these in order, what we do is we begin at the top line. Let's see if I tell you this. Here we go. The first line is letters. So the first thing that you want to look at is, is the top line, the letters. The second line is a whole number. So when you're looking at this, this is 1,175 as opposed to 118. The third line begins with a letter, um, so you would consider that letter, and then you would uh, consider the number that follows it, but that is a decimal number. So when you get to the third line, you're looking at a decimal number. Um, and you start at the top and you work your way down. And once you've got them in order, you don't look past what you need. You kind of ignore the rest of it. So on this, which one would come first? Which one should I put down here? PA. Okay, so because PA comes before anything else up here. So we'll kind of slide these down a little bit. And we'll put PA up here at this end. Now, which one of these would come last? Let me get out of the way. Which one comes last? Yeah. All right, the PS one comes last. So we'll shuffle these over and put PS down here. All right, and how about these in the middle? They all say PR. So which one should come first of these? Okay, 118, because it is uh, 118 as opposed to 1,000-something. So that one goes there. 
And how about these three that we have left right here? Uh, we have to drop down to the next line. They're all B. And on this line, we have to deal with decimal numbers. And I always tell the students, librarians aren't too good with math. Uh, so what we do, uh, there are different approaches to this, and I tell the students, if you have your own approach, use it, because whatever works for you is good. But, you know, this is 8 tenths, and this is 68 one hundredths, and this is 6,727 ten thousandths. Well, we can't do that. So what we do is we either use the add zeros, like add two zeros here, and three zeros here, or my favorite method is to just cover up everything but one letter at a time and just compare one letter at a time. So which one of these, um, which one of these, uh, are they in order? Okay, so they are in order. They just happen to fall into order there. So they are. Um, and usually the students have to kind of shuffle themselves around, but it worked out for us. They are still in order. So we do that exercise in class just so they'll understand how to put Library of Congress call numbers in order. Of course, it's a lot more fun when they're all up there giggling and tripping over each other. Okay, so we did, um, oh, I also have them uh, look at the back of this form right here. We just looked at this one when we were looking at World Cat and Books in Print. If you flip over to the back of this, um, you will see down at the bottom it says classification exercise. And what I have them do is I have them take that Library of Congress uh, sheet, the long Library of Congress sheet, this thing right here, and I just have them guess, and it's just an exercise in guessing, guess where these particular books would be. And then what they can do is uh, look them up in WorldCat and find out whether they got the answers right or not. But in terms of right, um, in cataloging, catalogers have a lot of leeway. So uh, something like uh, math for nurses, uh, a cataloger might put it under math or they might put it under nurses. So I never mark these things wrong at all. If their guess is at all reasonable, then it, you know, it's, it's right. So I don't mark them wrong. And of course, I only have them uh, make these guesses down to the letters of the alphabet. I don't have them put any numbers in here. There's no way they could do that. And when they look it up in WorldCat, they see the whole call number, letters, and numbers. But we're only guessing the first letters. So that's one exercise that I have them do. All right, let's see. Okay, this is just how to get on Blackboard. Um, and this is just more uh, Blackboard. And this is their homework. Uh, re, you know, we have the two texts, so I have them do some homework in both of the texts. But I also have them watch a DVD that is on reserve in the library that's called Printing Transforms Knowledge, A Matter of Fact. And it comes from a series that's called The Day the Universe Changed. And I don't know if any of you remember this. This thing must have come out in the early 80s uh, when they, they started with a man sitting, well, James Burke, the man who actually did this series, is sitting next to a computer and he holds up one of those big old floppy disks. So of course the students are all kind of giggling like this is so out of date. But the actual um, DVD is about the importance of movable type and how that affected the world, how things changed just because of the invention of movable type in the printing press. And when books became available, things were so very different. So I thought it was a wonderful DVD. And I asked the students what they thought. And two of the students said they thought it was great. They loved it. It was relevant to the course. Uh, three of the students said, it is so out of date. You, you need to update this thing. These people look so crazy with these long sideburns. And it's long. It is long. I have to tell you, it's long. So, But I love it. And um, I actually would like some feedback to see whether, uh, if you have a chance to watch that, see what you think about it. Because um, it didn't please everybody, but I thought it was great. 
so that's their homework. So, uh, and there's that participation journal that I never quite got around to. So that was week one. That was what we did on week one. Does anybody have any questions about that? Let me pull up week two here. Okay, so this is week two. And a lot of this comes right out of that information literacy book right here. So what I'm talking about often comes out of here. Um, well, I should back this up one. So what we talk about on week two, and when I say week two, actually it was day two this summer because every single class period was three hours, and so this was the second day, not really the second week. Um, but we talked about primary versus secondary sources, reference books, indexing, and by the way, that DVD, um, Printing Transforms Knowledge, talks a lot about indexing. James Burke gets so excited about indexing, he says, oh, indexing just opened up a world of knowledge. Woohoo! He giggles about it. Uh, so he really emphasize the importance of indexing. Boolean logic, and then of course we are working on Word. Um, there are different types of sources. There are primary sources, and a primary source is the original story. It's information that hasn't been changed or interpreted or condensed or evaluated. That would make it a primary source. So diaries and autobiographies are as an example. Interviews with people. And as I told you, we had one student in our class who did an interview with the man who managed the Hampton Coliseum for years. So he has a primary source that he's using. Newspaper articles that were written by someone who was actually on the scene. If a reporter goes down there and sits through um, the city council meeting and writes it up, that's a primary source. And original research reporting on scientific studies or experiments or observations, all of that would make that a primary source. Secondary sources are most books because they're based on some other information, most periodical articles, newspapers that analyze or editorialize or rehash an event, and AV materials such as DVDs are usually secondary sources. Books can also be divided up uh, by fiction and nonfiction. Fiction are stories based on the imagination. And of course, historical fiction is a subcategory of that, even though it has some true facts in it. Um, for example, uh, the characters might uh, somehow get caught into, in a um, uh, a Civil War battle that actually did happen, but it's still historical fiction because the characters themselves are works of the imagination. And nonfiction, of course, is information that's based on fact. A reference book is a nonfiction book, but it's a book that you would refer to for a particular piece of information. So I say, give me an example of a reference book. And of course, what do they all say? Dictionary, encyclopedia. So, yes, reference books are something you just refer to for a particular piece of information. Um, indexing. Um, again, James Burke just gave me such a great lead-in for indexing that it was wonderful. Um, in your book, in this book right here, the 100% um, Information Literacy book, the Taylor book, there's a table of contents in the front. And what is the order that the table of contents is arranged in? This one up front here. What order is this in? The, right, the, no, well, flip one more page. That's kind of, yeah, the table of contents. So what order is this in? The same order as what? Right, the same order as the material in the book. So that would be a table of contents. It's not an index. An index is found in the back of the book. So if you look back here, what order is the index in? Okay, so the index in the back of the book is in alphabetical order. 
Um, and it is cross-indexed. And it uses C and C also references. And again, this is something that James Burke was very excited about. So um, hopefully the students think it's a little more interesting than just what's in the back of their book. But if you look on page 229, you'll see, um, if you look under, let's find, look under G on, on page 229, G. Notice it says gateways, C web portals. What is that telling us? That's a C reference. What is that telling us? Right, right. Well, to get any information, because there's really nothing listed there under gateways, what it's saying is we're not using gateways in this book. If you want information on gateways, you need to see web portals to find information. That's also true, true under um, generic skills. See, it says see transferable skills. It's saying I'm not listing anything under here. What you need to do is look up transferable skills. So that's a C reference. But if you look under E for electronic resources, see electronic resources, notice there are some page numbers there. And then it says see also specific types. So that's a C also. It's saying there is some information here under electronic resources, but you should see also some other areas for additional information. So that's the C and C also references that you find uh, not only in the back of a book, but we'll be looking at some other indexes too. Okay, we did this. Okay, so now we're going to talk about keyword versus controlled vocabulary indexing. Keyword indexing, and you know, when we were looking in WorldCat, we had an option for keyword and we had an option for subject. This, this would be keyword indexing and this would be subject indexing down here. Oh no, where'd my screen go? It did, let's see if it'll come back on again. I have no idea. I mean, it will shut off if you don't use it in a certain period of time. Maybe I needed to touch it or something. Now it's saying warm up. Hmm. Okay, are we ready? Are we back? Okay, so we're back now. And uh, we had a little break there. And now we're talking about keyword versus controlled vocabulary indexing. Keyword indexing is something that um, stupid computers can do because the humans just give them a list of non-keywords, such as a, and, the, of, and they just go through and find the uh, keywords. Uh, controlled vocabulary indexing is something very different. It must be done by humans, and we're going to do that in just a minute. Um, keyword indexing, usually you will see that you have a choice when you search, for example, like when we searched uh, WorldCat and the TNCC catalog. Keyword searching was one of the things that we could do. It goes through and finds the keyword. Controlled vocabulary indexing is usually what we're searching, how we're searching when we search under subject because subject is a controlled vocabulary uh, list. So what I'm having you all do is to go through here and circle the keywords. So you've, you've circled the keywords. And um, so now I'm going to pretend like I'm doing a, a search. I want to find a, a poem on a particular subject. And we are creating an index to poetry. And there is such a thing as an index to poetry. This is Granger's index to poetry. Uh, this is a printed version, but of course there is also an online version at this point. So the online Granger's index to poetry can be searched online. Um, but what we're doing is we're creating our own little index right here in class. So um, let's say now I want to find an, uh, a poem that has to do with, um, uh, 
let's say, um, children. Does anybody, did anyone circle children as a keyword? And where the sidewalk ends, did you have children? Oh. But it is in there, right? So, oh, I think you missed the bottom one. Yeah, so you would, you probably would have circled children because it is not a non-keyword like a and the of. So I probably could have found something under children. Um, let's see, and the other one was hug a war. And if I searched on um, kisses, did you have kisses circled as a keyword. So I would have found something because the word kisses and the word children are right in there and they would have come up. But suppose I uh, was actually looking for a um, poem about war, honestly about, you know, fighting and war between nations and I searched on war. Um, did anybody end up circling war as a keyword? You, you probably would have because it's um, it is in hug a war, and um, it w you know it's not a non keyword, so it would have appeared as a keyword. So if I did a search a poetry search for war, hug of war would have come up, even though it's really not about war at all. Uh, suppose I did a search on non competitive games. Did anybody have non competitive games circled? Yeah, well, you didn't have non-competitive game circle because it wasn't in there. Uh, but hug a war actually would have been the kind of thing I was might be looking for because it's about uh, game. Hug a war is a game that is is not competitive. So you can now let's go back through our word list here, and this is our controlled vocabulary list right here. These are the words that we're allowed to use. And look through there and see if you can find a word uh, or if any of these words match up with your poem. It's on the back of the sheet, or it should be on the back of the sheet. See right there on the bottom, right here? Yeah, that's your word list, and that is going to be your controlled vocabulary list right there. So go through there and see if there are any of those words that you can assign to your poem. And you might want to circle those also that you're assigning to your poem. This works better when you have a bigger class and you have more people and more poems. You can uh, ask a lot more questions than we can do right here. So if I were going through there, now, and I'm doing a search, and I say, okay, I want a poem about children's games. Would either of you have selected children's games as um, appropriate for your poem? Yeah, so, yeah, maybe, maybe both of them. Definitely Hug of War is about... I will not play at tug of war, I'd rather play at hug of war. So that's about a children's game. So you would definitely assign that controlled vocabulary um, heading, uh, subject, to hug of war and probably also assign non-competitive games. Um, I'm not too sure that I had to. Children's poetry would be assigned to both of them. So if I went back and searched on any of those in the word list, once, that, once it had been indexed with controlled vocabulary indexing, then I could have found it. But if I was just going through there uh, searching for children's games or children's poetry uh, or non-competitive games, only after you did your keyword indexing, I wouldn't have found any of those because they're not in your poem. So they really aren't keywords that would have popped up. In a really good, uh, well-indexed, database, they let the computer do the keyword indexing first, then they go back and they add the controlled vocabulary words, and then when they do the keyword indexing, they index both the words in the poem, the controlled vocabulary words that have been assigned by humans to the poem, and then also the author and the title would also pop up in a keyword index. 
So that's kind of the difference between keyword indexing and controlled vocabulary, or keyword versus subject indexing. And let me see, I'm going to hit this button to see if that will keep the screen from um, cutting off. So um, this says to look at Granger's index to poetry, which we have here. Um, and you did a keyword index for a poem, and then you did a controlled vocabulary index for the same poem. Okay, so now we move on to Boolean logic. And probably you're going to feel a whole lot more comfortable with this because this is very uh, computer related. Um, Boolean logic is covered in the book. Um, I don't have the page right now, but it is definitely covered in this 100% uh, information literacy success book. And it is important to uh, searching both um, through Google searching and um, searching any of our Viva databases. So uh, knowing Boolean logic and understanding it is important. It's a system for using logical operators, and the logical operators are and, or, and not. There are others, but these are the only ones that we deal with. And it was named after George Boole, who was a British mathematician. Um, a set is an a set is a collection of elements, and elements can be anything. They can be dishes. I always put dishes up there because we always say a set of dishes. Dishes, numbers, cars, a set of um, elements, any elements is called, a collection of any elements is called a set. And we use Venn diagrams to represent sets. So that would be just a big old circle that looks like this. This is a set, and this is how we represent elements in the sets. We put little X's in them. Um, yeah, the circle rep represents the set, and the X represents the elements. And is the intersection of two sets. So I'm going to draw an and search up here. Uh, if I'm going to search for information about how global warming is affecting polar bears, I'm going to ask the computer, uh, ask the database to give me, to first search for all the articles about global warming. And that's what this represents. And then do a search for all the articles about polar bears, but if I'm doing an and search, I only want to see those articles that have something to do with global warming and polar bears. So that would be this part right here, the intersection of the two sets. And you have a handout there uh, that I use when I uh, have the students do this um, exercise right here, so you can start looking at this thing right here. Um, there should also be in your pack the uh, answers to that exercise. The students don't get the answers, just you do. Um, now, if you're going to do an or, this is and right here. If you're going to do an or, I say, okay, what part of this, if this is global warming and this is polar bears, how much of this would I cover, color in in order to show the union of two sets? Everything. Everything? Okay, absolutely right. We would color all this in. This is the union of these two sets right here. So this is everything that has to do with global warming or everything that has to do with polar bears. So I get a whole lot more. So if I'm doing a search and I do a search and I connect my terms together with and, I only get the intersection of those two sets. It narrows the, um, focus, narrows the focus of the search and it returns fewer results, but they're usually better results. If I do an or, I'm going to get lots of things, but um, they might be very off target. So usually what we do is an and search. And of course there's not. It removes elements from a set that are not in the second set. So if I did um, global warming and polar bears 
and let's say I'm really trying to learn something about polar bears and all I seem to be getting is how polar bears are being affected by global warming. I just, I'm, I just don't want to know about global warming. So then I could just do polar bears, not global warming, and then I could just erase out everything that has to do with global warming and this would become a knot. Well, this is global warming still. So now all I have is the stuff that is right in there. So that's the and and or and not when you're doing a search. So let's um, go to Google. And you guys can go to Google too. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So would that be the same as if you were putting a search in quotations to make it more specific? Is that like a graphical recipe? Representation of that? Usually when you put it in quotes, you're saying um, you want both of those words and you want them right next to each other. Okay. Right, as, as a phrase. Okay. And in a second, um, actually when we get to Google, you can see this happening. Um, let's see, in show. And let me, yeah, let's just go to Google. And let's go to advanced search, um, which is right over here, advanced search, and hit that button. Where do you get the Google on the um, I'm not sure how to get it to go up there. You don't have it on yours, do you? You might have to just do uh, www.google.com, yeah. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this search right here. Um, find information on coal mining safety laws and regulations in Virginia. So we've gone to advanced search right here. And we say, okay, we want all of these words. So this is where I'm going to put coal mine. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to put it, see where it says this exact wording or phrase? I'm going to put it there because uh, if we, if there was something up here on Google that talked about um, the coal black kitten was so cute that I knew she must be mine, uh, we would get that back unless we either, as you said, put it in quotes or put it in this exact wording or phrase. So we're making it a phrase here. And then uh, we're just going to go ahead and do a search on it and see what we get. So when you do that search, you notice that coal mine comes out in uh, quotes right there. So it put the quotes around it. And notice that we got about, what is that, 3 million hits when we did coal mine. So we want to narrow it down some. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to advanced search and we're going to say, um, okay, one or more of these words. Um, we also want, well, let's do all of these words. Let's just put safety up there. Coal mine safety. And then uh, just go ahead and do advanced search again. And we're down to 1 million and some hits because now we have safety and we have coal mine. And it ands them together. And if you put the word and up there, it either ignores it or it gives you a little message saying, you don't have to include the word and because that's the kind of search I do. So what I have the students do is I have them go along on this sheet and color in uh, the part of, and actually I put it up on the board too, and color in what we're doing as we're doing the search. So that uh, kind of helps them see what we're doing here. So um, then we can go back. Actually, we could actually do it here. Go back. And then we say one or more of these words. So let me, actually I think I will do this. Um, do this one. So what we've done so far is we did coal, mine, and 
they sort of got anded together because of the block that we put them in. So we got that as a result. Now we also want the word safety up there. So when we added the word safety, better make that a little bit bigger. I'll come down here. I put the word safety in. Now all of a sudden, all this right in here has to disappear because it's not in safety up here. Now if we're going to do an or, uh, law or regulation, we would color the whole thing in. So that's one of the things that they do on that sheet right there. But I'm just going to go ahead and put it right in here and let's see if I can work it in in a good spot. It's going to get very tiny. This will be law. I know it gets very confusing. Law or regulation. And even though we say, I want information about coal, line, coal mine safety laws and regulations, we don't really mean and. We don't mean that it has to be both a law and a regulation. We mean it has to be a law or a regulation. So then when you get right here, um, you have to have law or regulation, which is not what's going on up here. So we get to erase this little part out right here, out of our little messy drawing right here. And then uh, we, want, we want to say, and it has to be in Virginia. So let's do that on the screen right here. Um, let's put in law or regulation and um, hit advanced search and this should narrow it down some more so it may have narrowed it down a little bit but not a whole lot still but we're working on it so you can see that our number of hits has gone down some um, so back to our advanced search and then we also want to say that it's in Virginia so um, all of these words, I'm going to put Virginia up here, right up there, and then I'm going to go ahead and search it. But when we get to this page, you'll notice up here that a lot of these things, even though we're searching Virginia, and sometimes we actually get Virginia. This has to do with Virginia right here. But notice we're also getting a lot of stuff about West Virginia up, up here. So what we want to do is get rid of West Virginia. So we can go back to our advanced search. What are we down to now? Well, we have less than a million hits. We only have um, 273,000. So gosh, we could not exactly get through it. But And then what we can do is we can say, but don't show pages that have West. So that will eliminate all that West Virginia. Unfortunately, It'll eliminate things like um, coal mining safety in Virginia west of the New River. Uh, so you might, it might work to put West Virginia here. But in any case, we eliminate anything with the word West in it. And that should get rid of a lot of those West Virginia things. So when we're done with all this, let's see if I can, I'm not sure I can even fit two more circles on top of here to do this. Um, no, I think I've made too small a mark on here, but you can see it on your um, page right here. Uh, we can work this down so that we get only the things that have to do with Virginia and not West Virginia. I'll just have to draw better next time. Does that mean that you're coloring everything in where there's an intersection? No, you have this too, right oh, here. Okay. Yeah, the answers. Yeah, so I'm coloring in only where I, um, only the results, where the results that I okay. want to see would be. Mm -hmm. Now, number five is just an example, but this is mm -hmm. ultimately what okay. we end up with, number six down here. So, um, 
that's how we use a Boolean logic doing these searches. And you know, so many of those Viva databases have the little drop down box that says and, or, or not. And the students, of course, don't know what to do with them, so they pretty much ignore them. But once they go through this, they should have some idea of how to use those and, or, or not boxes. OK, um, so let us go back to where we were here. All right, so we did that. All right, homework, watch that DVD. And if you do get a chance to watch it, let me know what you think of it. And then go to the library and do reference sources worksheet and read Chapter 3 in Taylor. And, of course, the Shelley text is the, um, the Microsoft um, um, Office text. Now, the reference sources worksheet, that's in here too. And I do give that as a homework assignment because it does take a while to do. And um, I've learned a little something this semester by having them do this because I don't think I gave them good enough directions. And I'm not sure that doing it in the library is the right answer, but um, that's what I had them do this semester. Or maybe I should do it in the library, but I should have gone to the library with them. Um, you have a worksheet that says reference books and corresponding online sources. And this is what they were supposed to take over to the library. And what they were supposed to do is look at each one of these books. I actually pulled the books for them and put it on a cart so they didn't have to go search for them. But I also give them the call number here. So if you decide to use this worksheet um, and you don't get a chance to tell us to pull the books, they can just go find them. They're all in the reference section, and they're very easy to find, actually. And then my plan was to have them look at each one of these books and just tell me very simply, probably in three sentences, what the purpose of the book is, what kind of information it contains, and the arrangement of it. Is it, is it arranged alphabetically? If not, how is it arranged? Um, of course, I pulled things like the Oxford English Dictionary. This is just volume one of the Oxford English Dictionary. This just um, covers from A to B, and not even all the way through B. And it gives the history of English words. So they're supposed to look at this and try to figure out what in the world they're looking at and how it works. And just give me three sentences telling me about this book, about the purpose, the content, and the arrangement. Um, I don't think they realize that they have to actually interact with the book and look something up. And uh, most of them just tried to find a page at the beginning that explained what the purpose of that book was. And some of them found a page and did a good job of copying the information down. But I don't think they really understood when they were done any more than when they started. So next time I'm going to go to the library with them, just use class time and go over there and say, what does this book do? Um, the reason that I have this exercise in here is because in this textbook, the Taylor text, there is a, a section in here. Let's see, I think it's around page 40, where does it start? Around page 47, where it starts listing different types of books. It, lists types of encyclopedias, types of dictionaries, types of directories, different almanacs, um, different indexes. So it goes on and on with lists of these various types of reference books. Well, if the students know what these reference books are, then they really don't need the list. And if they don't know what the reference books are, then this list doesn't really help them. They'll just look at this and say, OK, here are some titles. So what I tried to do was pick one of each of these different kinds of reference books, put it in the cart, and try to have them interact with it. And the purpose is not for them to memorize anything about this particular book, but just get the general idea that there are lots of different kinds of reference books. They're arranged in uh, different ways. And hopefully, down the road someday, when they have a question and they need some information, they'll say, gee, I wonder if there is a reference book that does such and such. So that was the whole purpose of this exercise. And also, for each one of these, there is a corresponding online site. So 
they were supposed to also go to the online site and interact with that online site. I don't know if they quite got the idea that they needed, if they were, look, if they were looking at a dictionary site, they needed to just pick a word, any word, type it in there and see how it worked. Um, again, I'm not so sure that they actually did that. Well, bless you. <laughs> One more, okay. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> Bless you twice. So that is the exercise that I had them do to cover reference books. But next time, I think they need a little more oversight than I gave them this time. And again, the participation journal, which we never quite had time to do. So we'll close out of this one. That was the end of that. And let's see. Open, that was... Um, all right, that was week two. We gotta hurry this up here. Okay. Um, what's that? Touch my board every now and then. Okay. All right. All right. So here we are, and this is chapter six in this Taylor text. I did jump around. Um, I didn't go straight through the book the way it's written because I felt like I needed to do chapter six so that I could get to how to cite sources. They were collecting sources. They needed to know how to cite them. So I did jump forward and do chapter six before I did four and five. So here we are on chapter six. Um, and this information that I've got up here comes right out of the book. So um, I'm just kind of repeating what's already in that chapter. Copyright. Um, there is a concept in the law called intellectual property. And intellectual property is property just as uh, real estate property is property and your car is property. Intellectual property is property, uh, it's, but it's property that is created by the mind and it can cover literary works such as books, poems, essays, and song lyrics, artwork such as designs and photographs, here I remind them that most of the images up there on Google are copyrighted and that they should not take those images and use the, and put them up on a web page of their own that they're uploading to the web. Interviews can be copyrighted, names and ideas. Intellectual property can be, is owned by the creator of the work. Um, and it can be bought and sold just like other property, and it can be inherited by the heirs of the creator of the work. Um, copyright is how the law keeps straight who owns particular property. So the purpose of the copyright law is to make it profitable for people to create works of the intellect. Otherwise, nobody would bother to do it. The creator of the uh, work is the person who owns the copyright, whether or not that person registered it with the copyright office, they still own the copyright. And the copyright, uh, copyright allows the owner of the copyright to decide who may photocopy it, translate it, make it into a movie, um, and there are other examples in the book. And I tell the students that when my daughter was in high school and she was applying to college, she had taken a photography course and she had a lot of photographs that she had taken that uh, she wanted to have photocopied and attached to her application. So I took the photographs down there and asked them if they would please photocopy this, you know, make it look good, put it on a nice quality paper. And they said, did you take these? And I said, no. Well, then we can't possibly photocopy them. I'm sorry, you'll have to get copyright permission in order to um, have us photocopy these. So I had to drag my daughter in. It didn't help that I was her mother. I had to drag her in before they would actually photocopy those um, photographs that she wanted to attach to her application. Copyright does expire. Um, it, the copyright protection lasts for a specific amount of time and it's usually the life of the creator plus seven years. And this is why, where I say, why the seven years? And those people who have read the chapter the way they were supposed to say, oh, so that the heirs can sort out what they're going to do with that copyright, sell it or work it out. Um, 
when the copyright expires, it goes into the public domain and it, the work goes into the public domain and it can be used by anybody. So I say, what are some examples? And they give me examples of the Bible and Shakespeare and other um, works that are in the public domain. Fair use is the name that's given to special exceptions or exemptions in the copyright law that allows other people to use copyrighted material without getting permission from the copyright holder. And in the area of education, there are some fair use um, um, exemptions in the copyright law. And um, in an educational setting where no money is being made, uh, there are things that we can do without permission. Uh, but they are very specific things. For example, a teacher can't make multiple copies of um, something that is copyrighted and hand those out to all the students. But the teacher can, let's say, an article out of a magazine. I can't photocopy that article out of the magazine and hand it out to a lot of students. But I can put that article on reserve in the library and then the students can go over and they can all make one copy for themselves. So it is very specific about what can be done. And you can't show a video at a student activities event because it's not really uh, in the classroom. It's not really an educational activity. So there are things that you think you might be able to do, but you actually can't. Plagiarism is a way to uh, use someone else's work and ideas uh, without violating the copyright law. Use them in your own paper, but you have to give credit uh, to the person who actually came up with the original idea. Um, and to avoid plagiarism, what you need to do is cite your sources. So we spend a lot of time talking about how to cite sources. And we do go over the format here on this particular day. We only go over the format on how to cite um, a book. So we, that is in the, um, the Taylor text. There is an example of that in this chapter. But I also always bring the, ML, the Little Brown Handbook with the MLA information in the back because it always gets more complicated than just the simple example in this book. Um, now, this part um, is fairly fun for the students to do. What I had them do, and I don't think we really have enough time to do this. I think we'll run out of time if we do it, even though it's fun. I had each one of the um, students pick a country, a different country. And then I had them go to the internet and do a Google search for that particular country. And when they found something, I had them open a Word document and just cut and paste that information about that country into a Word document. And I said, now see, what you're doing here is you have a paper due tomorrow on this particular country, but you don't want to stay home writing about this country all night. You have a party to go to. So what you're going to do is you're just going to take this off the Internet, put it in a Word document, and you're just going to turn it in and say that you created this. This is your paper. So they all go, oh, okay, and they... Uh, copy and paste right off of the internet, and then I do have them print that out. Um, you could either have, at first I was going to have them exchange papers, uh, but as it turned out in this particular class, I just let them uh, keep their own uh, printout. And I said, now, it's the next day, now you're the teacher, and a student has just handed you this uh, paper that they wrote last night. So what I want you to do, I want you to think, um, you know, this doesn't really sound like the writing that this student usually does. So I'm going to go to Google, and I'm just going to type in some words. I don't know where this student might have gotten this um, particular information. I don't know what website they visited. But I'm going to go to Google, and I'm just going to pick a phrase out of that paragraph, and I'm going to type that phrase in. And that's what they did. And in every case, their original website popped right up there as the first one on the Google list. So they all went, ooh, good heavens, we never thought of this. Okay, we better not do this. So it really turned out to be a fun thing to do and I think very enlightening that, um, you know, teachers aren't really completely out of it and unaware of some of the things that the students do. And then also what we did that same day, and this is a word exercise, this book, um, 
if you've had a chance to look at this, you will see that this has much less in it than the 115 book that you have been using. And it just covers the highlights of each one of these uh, programs, each one of the Word programs, and in uh, each one of the Office programs. And in Word, just about the only thing it does is have you make a flyer. And the flyer is good because um, they get to insert a graphic, they get to do a border, they get to change the font size, they get to do a bulleted list, so that exercise is good. But the truth of the matter is, in the near future, what most students will be using Word for is to type papers. So I took some time and went through how to type a paper in Word. Um, did the title page, the outline, the header with the page numbers, set the margins. Um, and then I had them type a little bit out of actually both books, a little bit of information out of both, both books, and had them use the um, citation feature that's in Word where it does the works cited page for you, which is really nifty, and they were excited about that. Wow, this is great. But then I also showed them how to do a hanging indent um, they don't really have to do the hanging indent if they're using this um, automatic citation page maker, but just in case they're typing up a separate page, which they actually eventually have to do for their references, I did want to point out how to do a hanging indent since that's how you do MLA format. So let's see. Okay, that's the end of this week. So anybody have any questions about that one? Um, I think I can do it. Let me see. Where are we? We are on four. Periodicals and Viva. Um, we could get started on this and then we could just kind of stop and um, you can kind of wave your hands around when things are looking uh, close. Yeah, it's just easy to put it in the paper. Is it now? Then we don't worry about it. Okay, well then go ahead. I just hate to waste 15 minutes. Okay, so now we're moving on, and um, you'll notice we're backtracking. We're going back to Chapter 3 in Taylor. So we're um, not taking that book in order. And so uh, during this week or class period, depending on what kind of session you're teaching, we're covering periodicals and the Viva Online Periodical Database and MLA Citation for Periodical Articles. So what is a periodical? It's a publication that is published on a recurring basis. So what's an example of periodicals? I ask them, of course, newspapers, magazines, and no one says journals. Newspapers, everyone's familiar with. Magazines are written for the general public and they're usually uh, published to uh, make a profit. And I point out that there's nothing wrong with making a profit and many magazines have excellent articles in them, but they are different from journals. Journals are, um, have a different purpose. Journals are also called scholarly journals, academic journals, or peer-reviewed journals. And the reason that they are published is not to make a profit, but to share knowledge in a particular field, share it with other people in that field and with students who are trying to learn information about that field. Um, the, there are three ways that you can identify a journal, and I usually bring them to class and let the students um, look at them and try to find these particular things. I should have brought some for you, but I didn't. Uh, in each one of the journals, there should be a list of peers or associate editors or experts who review each article before it's accepted for publication in that journal. And they usually list the names of all those people who are doing the peer review. So usually you can tell a journal uh, in that way. There's also a list of references or works cited that the article, 
that the author read before he or she wrote the particular article, and they are usually at the end of each article. So you can usually tell that it's um, a journal by finding that. And um, also the name of the scholarly or professional organization that publishes that journal can be found inside the periodical. So those are the three ways that I have them identified journals. And um, if you are teaching this and you want some journals to pass out in class, I'm going to ask um, uh, one of the, the women who, Susan, who takes care of the periodicals, uh, in the library if she will start collecting some that she wants to discard so we can bring them to class. Hmm? Oh, touch the board. Okay. Have to touch the board so it won't disappear. Okay. Of course, to find periodical articles, you cannot use the online catalog. That that will tell you that we have a particular periodical. It'll tell you that we have Time Magazine or the Journal of the American Medical Association, but it won't tell you what's inside those um, particular periodicals. So back in the olden days, oh, I didn't bring it. We used to have, we used to use something called Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, and I meant to bring it over here. Do you all remember Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature? So I do bring that and I do show that to them. We don't subscribe to it in the printed format anymore. Uh, but just so they understand that there are printed indexes and how lucky they are not to have to use them, I do have an example in here. Let's see. If you look through your um, papers, you'll see something that says Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature. And I show them that that's how you used to have to find a periodical article. And you'll notice if you look under college students here on your um, handout, it says see also, and then it lists some other places you can look. So I remind them what a see also reference is. If they want information about college students, there is information here, but they can also see black college students, business school students, college graduates, etc. Then after that list of see also, it comes down uh, to the first entry. It says everybody else's college education. So what, it, have you got the form? The, no. It says reader's guide up here on the top. Have you got yours? Okay. I must have given you a bad packet. There it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. So where it says everybody else's college education, what is, oh, you don't even know where I'm reading that yet, do you? Right down here. Everybody else's college education. Mm -hmm. under college. What is that? Title of the article, right. So everybody else's college education is the title of the article. What is L. Menand, the author of the article? Okay, the IL means it's illustrated. What is the New York Times Magazine? That's kind of a giveaway. T title of the periodical, right. And then the P48-9 means it's on page 48 to 49 in the New York Times Magazine, which issue? Right, so that's how um, you would look something up back in the olden days. But fortunately, we do not have to do that anymore. We don't have to use printed index indexes. Um, we can use online indexes. So I do want to show you this. And... Um, that means I need to end the show for just a second and switch over to Internet Explorer. So if you can switch over with me here. And just go back to the TNCC website. And again, you want to go to um, Learning Resources library. Back to this page. This page needs some spiffing up because sometimes it's kind of hard to know what you're looking at on this page. And we keep talking about it. I think eventually we'll do it. Uh, but 
These are the periodical indexes right here where it says favorite Viva article databases. These are the ones that are most popular with our students right here. And there are actually about 200 of these Viva uh, databases and these are just the most popular ones. To see all of them, uh, if you scroll down, you can, we already looked at the Viva resources by title and you can also look up Viva resources by subject and you'll see all of them that are available. The only one that I'm going to show you uh, this evening is General OneFile. And it's really kind of a shame because General OneFile is going away at the end of August. Uh, as I told you, the Viva databases are purchased uh, by all the colleges in a big lump. And so every year we have people send us um, a proposal, a bid on this. And General OneFile is a Gale database, and Gale lost the uh, bid this time, and EBSCO got it. And so we're switching over to EBSCO at the end of August. But I'll show you this anyway, even though uh, you'll have to kind of relearn the databases once we get the new ones. And we have to learn them too because we're, we're not familiar with what we're getting. When you switch over here uh, to the Gale database, when you click on it, it comes up in a subject guide search. This search right here is the subject guide search. That's the one that's highlighted. This is actually a controlled vocabulary search. This basic search is actually a keyword search. And the advanced search is the one that allows you to use and, or, or not. So I'm just going to do a subject guide search right here. And um, you can search whatever you'd like. Um, I'm going to search polar bears. Uh, notice on this particular screen, you can limit this to documents with full text, and you can limit it to those peer-reviewed publications. So if they have to find a journal, you can say, just click that peer-reviewed box, and it will show you only the journals. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and just let it do a search for any sort of periodical. Now notice it says subject terms, and it didn't like polar bears. It's saying the controlled vocabulary word is polar bear, and I should have searched under polar bear, but I can just click on that link, and it will switch me over to polar bear. I have 553 articles, so I click on that, and here are my results right here. I have this many general magazines this many scholarly or academic journals, 135. I have articles out of books, newspaper articles, and multimedia, which is mostly interviews on national public radio. Um, this one right here, environment, environmentalists have sued to get the Interior Department to list the polar bear as an endangered species. This, again, is the title of the article. Okay, what is National Review? Title of the magazine it came out of. This is the volume, 60, issue, 10. This is the date, the June 2nd, 2008 edition of National Review. And it's on page four, and it's just a little short blurb, really. It is here full text, though. So if I clicked on full text, my screen will open up and I can see it full text. The second one, however, you'll notice this one is only here. I only have the citation. So no matter what I click on, it's not going to open full text. So if they only want to see full text, they can mark the full text box before they do the search, and it will only show the ones that are full text. Otherwise, they're going to get the citations also. Um, what else do I need to tell you about this? Oh, let me just switch you back to advanced search just to show you. I'm just going to switch over to advanced search just to show you that here's an example of where they can put their Boolean um, operators to work here with the and, the or, and the not. So it does all tie in when we do this search. So they do this and they do find some periodical articles on their topic. So do you have any questions about that? Okay, well then let's go back to where we were. We don't need that one.
And these are some of those databases. General one file we just looked at. I also have them look at CQ Researcher and Opposing Viewpoints. CQ Researcher will definitely stay this fall, so we'll have that again. Opposing Viewpoints, it's going to disappear unless Thomas Nelson picks it up and pays the cost of it. But we like it a lot, and our students like it a lot, so we may actually go ahead and pay for that ourselves. And then there are, these are general databases, a little bit of everything. And then there are these subject-specific databases that uh, narrow in on either science periodicals or medical periodicals. And there are a lot of those, too. So you would go to that same Thomas Nelson page where we were, and then you would click on all Viva resources by subject link, and they would all be listed right there for you. A lot of those, however, are not full text. So, but there's always the interlibrary loan service, which I keep trying to sell. So if a student finds something there and it's not full text, um, have them come to the library, fill out a form, and we'll get it for them. Now, I also tell them about Google Scholar. And I say, we're calling this a database, but it isn't. Uh, Google is really a search engine. It's not a database. It searches the web. Google Scholar is not really a database either. Um, it's also a search engine, but it searches a lot of the um, databases that are out there and gives you great results. And I just love Google Scholar. If you haven't seen it, you really should give it a good uh, try because it's wonderful. Instead of choosing one of those Viva databases and guessing which one might have some information. If you search in Google Scholar, it searches a lot of those databases and returns the results for you. Um, uh, l let me show you that. Let's see if I can stop this. Go to Google. Oh, I have a button. Only me. Okay. And then once you're here at Google, see where it says more? And then you just uh, find Scholar right there, right there, hit Google Scholar, and then you can search right here. And the interesting thing about this is a lot of these databases that it searches are paid databases. And so if you're searching this from off campus, a lot of times you'll click on this and you won't be able to get in. It says, send us $16 and we'll send you the article. And you think, well, I don't want to send you $16. But if you're here on campus and you do the search and you end up in a database uh, that is paid for already through Viva, it'll just open up the article for you. So you'll have it right here. So if you're searching Google Scholar, it's better to do it here on campus than to do it at home. And again, if you find something where they want $16 for the article, print out the information that you have, come to the library, do an interlibrary loan form, and we would be glad to try to get that for you from one of the larger libraries. Of course, a lot of them have gone to online databases and they don't have the print copy anymore so sometimes uh, it's not so easy to find out who has the online database and get them to send it through interlibrary loan but we always give it a try okay um, and here and there is a worksheet in your packet where they look in all four so-called databases I'm put that in quotes because I'm also having them look in Google Scholar and it's not really a database uh, but there is a worksheet in here. I hope. Do you see one that says Viva? Uh, find full text periodic article. Full text periodical articles. This one right here. Yes, but that definitely will have to be updated um, this fall because we won't have general one file and we might not have oppo um, opposing viewpoints. So this needs updating. So if you are teaching this and you want to use this worksheet, send me an email because I know I'll forget and say, could you send me the updated uh, worksheet for finding periodical, 
periodical articles using Viva, and I'll send it to you. I haven't done it yet because we haven't gotten the new databases. And so that's the end of that week. So let's close out of here and move on. Okay, so we're on week six now. Now we have no week five. We skipped that because that, which is actually a day, that day uh, in the summer eight-week course, we did, we spent the whole time doing Excel. So I don't have anything for you there. So now we are moving to chapter four in Taylor, critical thinking skills and evaluating information. <clears throat> And this is some pretty general stuff. I think you'll feel very comfortable teaching this. Um, it doesn't really have anything to do with the library, but I'm going to just go over it and show you how I taught it. But I think each of you will come up with your own method of teaching this. Um, critical thinking is one of the skills that is listed on the course of study for, the, for ITE 119. And it doesn't really tell you how to teach it. I noticed that in this book, there are little boxes along the edge that uh, suggest um, critical thinking questions are listed over here along the edge. So you could use those, but I didn't. Uh, what I did was I tried to take a scientific approach to this. And uh, my inspiration, actually, was this... Um, This, I guess you'd call it, I don't know that you would call it an article. I found this uh, essay of sorts um, on the Internet. It's called An Introduction to Science, Scientific Thinking and the Scientific Method. And um, I kind of liked this, trying to find some way to teach critical thinking skills. Sharon has a whole book that is devoted to teaching critical thinking skills. And at first we were talking about maybe getting the students to buy that book. And then we thought, no, there just isn't enough time in this course. So, and it took a very different approach. So I'm just showing you my approach. But you can kind of work out your own approach on how to teach critical thinking skills. Critical thinking is thinking about thinking. And we examine how we think in order to improve our thinking skills. We want to think better, so we have to think about how we think. So um, the approach I took, as I said, was to use a scientific approach to thinking. Um, first, we talked a little bit about the scientific method. It was first described by Al Hazan from Basra, Iraq, uh, when Iraq was part of the Persian Empire. And the purpose of the scientific method is to discover truth. So. Um, that's what we're working towards when we use the scientific method. And it's not just a way of thinking, it's a way of acting and doing, too. So when you use this, you begin by asking a question. And my example is people always ask me when they see me walking around with my Krispy Kreme bag and my Krispy Kreme cup, how can you eat those donuts all the time and stay so skinny? And um, so I say, okay, that's a question. Maybe I'll try to figure out how I can eat those donuts all the time and stay so skinny. So first I need to do some background research. What's in a Krispy Kreme donut? Um, how many calories is it? Has anybody else researched this uh, information? So I want to do some background research. Then I construct a hypothesis or guess. And so I'm going to guess that the reason is that if you eat Krispy Kreme donuts for breakfast, they fill you up so much that you don't get hungry till 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and you don't eat a decent lunch, you don't eat much lunch, and so therefore uh, it makes you skinnier than the average person. Then you have to test this with an experiment. So you have to have a control group, people who don't eat at Krispy Kreme, and people, the people who do eat at Krispy Kreme, they are the people that you are going to test. Um, and what you would probably have to do is weigh people who, in both groups and um, find out what time they eat lunch in the afternoon and collect your information, your data. And then you have to analyze your results and find out whether you were right or not about your hypothesis. If your hypothesis is true, great. Uh, you would go ahead and report the results. You'd make big news in the Journal of the American Medical Association and you'd be famous. If it's false, nobody uh, 
cares a thing about you. You still need to try to report your results, uh, but it's probably not nearly as interesting. And it's this area right here where scientists are so, have such a hard time saying, you know, I'd really love to fudge this and make it a little more interesting, but I stress to the students that, you, that truth is important here and that you have to report the results truthfully. If you're wrong and you really care, you have to go back and construct a new hypothesis and try again. What they don't show you on here is that these results actually should have a line that say, go back up here for background research because the people that report the results, these results are used by other people who are doing uh, research and they would use these results as their background research. So that's the scientific method. Um, there's also scientific thinking, which is, works along with the scientific method, but is a little bit different. And this, the components of critical thinking or scientific thinking are empiricism, uh, the use of empirical evidence, rationalism, the practice of logical reasoning, and skepticism, possessing a skeptical attitude. Um, and so we're going to talk about each one of those right there. Um, the use of empirical evidence. Empirical evidence is evidence that you can see, hear, touch, smell. It's evidence that other people can he see, hear, touch, smell. And it's repeatable. So if you take, um, the way I do, you take tomato sauce and you put it in the refrigerator and you leave it there for about five months and then you clean out the refrigerator, there it has something green growing on that. Well, if you did it again a second time, and five months later you would look, it would probably have something green growing on it too. So that is evidence that green stuff grows in your refrigerator on tomato sauce. Um, the most common alternative to empirical evidence is authoritarian evidence. And they do talk about this in this handout right here. He talks about a lot of different kinds of evidence, but this is the only one that I mentioned. And this one right here um, is the kind of evidence that you're listening to now, someone standing up here and talking to you. This is also, uh, your textbook uses authoritarian evidence, so it's not always bad. You just have to know whether or not the so-called authority knows what they're talking about. Um, rationalism is the practice of logical reasoning, and logical reason, reasoning is a very complex topic. It takes a whole semester to teach in philosophy class, so we don't go into it much, but we do say it's not emotional thinking. It's not that I want something to be true. I want to have a guardian angel over here on my shoulder taking care of me, but I can't see, hear, smell, touch, or feel her. So I'm not sure that she um, actually exists since she does not meet these, uh, the logical reasoning and the empirical evidence. And it's not hopeful thinking either. So that's what it's not. I will say in this class period, we ended up talking a lot about the Bermuda Triangle, about unidentified flying objects, about all kinds of things that you can't uh, see or hear or touch or smell, but which must be true. Uh, skepticism, at least according to the students, skepticism is possessing a skeptical attitude. It's constantly questioning your own beliefs and keeping an open mind, being willing to change your beliefs if, if you discover that you're wrong. And it helps you avoid deception by others by keeping an open mind. And it also helps you avoid self-deception. And I gave them, as an extra credit, an opportunity to read either this entire article right here on reserve in the library or this little book right here called Maybe Yes, Maybe No, a guide for young skeptics. Of course, this was the most popular of the two, as you can imagine. And although it's a very simple book and it has kind of a silly example of ghosts in the kitchen, uh, still it does make the point of uh, being um, how important it is to be a skeptic. And if you don't have enough evidence to either decide a question one way or the other, you can always say to yourself, well, maybe yes. Maybe no. That's keeping an open mind. Um, so that is the reserve item that is on reserve. 
and maybe yes, maybe no, says when searching for an answer, check it out, which means use empirical evidence, do it again, see if it's repeatable, try to prove that it's wrong. Um, Albert Einstein said no amount of research will prove a theory right, but one occurrence will prove a theory wrong. And back to my polar bears again, if you see a hundred polar, a hundred white polar bears, does that prove that every polar bear is white? No. If you see a thousand white polar bears, does that prove that every polar bear is white? But suppose you see one brown polar bear, does that show us anything about, uh, does that prove that every polar bear is white? It proves that not every polar bear is white. So one um, occurrence will prove a theory wrong. Consider where, whether uh, an answer is logical, in other words, use logical reasoning, and be honest, no self-deception or deception of others. And if you aren't sure about something, just tell yourself, maybe yes, maybe no. And here we went to um, Snopes.com. I don't know if you all are familiar with that. Uh, that is that site where you go when somebody sends you an email about that adorable missing child. You go, you know, this child has been lost and please help us find our child. You go here and you find out that it's just a, a, yeah, a crank email. So this is a good thing for them to look at and I think it sort of ties in with the idea of being a skeptic. Like urban legends. Yes, urban legends, that's exactly it, yes. So now we're switching uh, topics here and we're evaluating information in books, periodicals, or on the internet. So I'm not just talking about any one place, I'm talking about all of these different places. So um, this is how you would evaluate information. And I've got a long list here, but in just a minute I'm going to go through every single one of them. And again, this is all in the textbook, so when you're doing your preparation, you're going to see it all there. Uh, you can evaluate information by evaluating the authority. The, uh, the authority of the author. What are the author's qualifications? Well, you look at his or her academic degrees, work-related experience, affiliation with professional organizations, and other publications that that author has actually published. Um, you evaluate the authority by evaluating the publisher. Oops, back we go. Uh, books are published by university presses. Uh, and usually university presses uh, have their books reviewed, peer reviewed the same way journals are peer reviewed. So in general, university presses publish books that are fairly trustworthy. Then there are specialized presses, uh, things like Thompson, which we're all familiar with, that publish all these textbooks. There are government print presses, the government printing office and state printing offices. There are very large presses like Random House and other large um, publishing houses that usually publish popular books. And then there are subsidy publishers that are also called vanity presses. And these are the ones that you have to really be a little bit uh, suspicious of. I really shouldn't say suspicious, but you do have to kind of question them. Vanity presses are those publishers that ask you to pay up front for uh, publishing something. Say you want a family history published, you wrote this family history, you know it's not going to sell, it's going to be a big seller, but a vanity press will go ahead and publish it for you for a cost. And um, for a while I was on the WIF history committee and we decided we would publish a little book that was mostly photographs, old photographs of the Wyth neighborhood and we contacted a publisher that was willing to work with us. We did have to pay them up front. I have to admit that this particular publisher was very good. They had us fill out a huge packet asking questions like how many people live in with, how many visitors do you have to with, uh, how much of this, how, do you really think you can sell this book? So we actually had to do a, a review, a business review of this business venture and it turned out to be very interesting and it also turned out that we did make some money on it. It got, well we knew it would get published because we were, oh, and we also got a grant from the city of Hampton, so that helped a little bit too. Um, and it did get published, um, 
I, I was no longer on the committee, but the people who carried on did get it published, and it actually made some money. So that was, of course, the grant help. Um, evaluating information, um, the publisher. Now, you know, we talked about book publishers. Websites are published by government um, educational organizations and then other types of organizations, both good and bad, and really just anybody can publish a website. And they know that now because at the end of the course, they all did a web page on their topic and they realized that anybody can do a web page. Anybody can put that information up there. So I think doing that web page was a really good um, exercise for them to get the idea that it's really not that difficult. Um, and then what, what we also go over on page 122 and 123 of the Taylor text, it does have a picture of a URL and it shows you how to back out to the original, to the um, domain server. Let's see, let's see what they actually call it. They call it top level domain name. Back it out to the, the dot com or the dot edu. If you don't know who's sponsoring the page, you just back out till you get to the dot com or dot edu. So we had them do that. Evalu back to evaluating information. Uh, you also want to evaluate the currency. In print publications, you want the, de the copyright date. On websites, you want to look for last updated. If there isn't any date, sometimes you can tell whether the hyperlinks work or not. That kind of gives you a clue how long it's been since somebody looked at that. Then we evaluate content. Who is the intended audience? Is it children? Is it adults? Is it specialists? And depending on who the intended audience is, the level of the information might vary. Um, what is the purpose and scope? Why is that information being presented? Is this the big picture? Or am I just looking at a narrow focus? So all of this is in the book. Evaluating objectivity. Is this fact or is this opinion? Um, is it biased? Does it only show one side of an argument? And a lot of the organizations do have a bias, and that's OK. Uh, that's, that's why they exist, to present their point of view. So it's not that. Uh, they shouldn't have a web page or you shouldn't visit it. You should just be aware of what their uh, purpose is and what their bias is. Evaluate accuracy and verifiability. Are the facts accurate? If you look them up someplace else, do, uh, does someone else agree with these facts? Are the visual aids accurate? Um, do they do the lying with charts and graphs? We've all seen that, and I do show them that in class. And um, do they take Photoshop and put one per, put, you know, take Hillary Clinton and put her in Barack Obama's lap with Photoshop? Because you know you can do anything with Photoshop. And um, are those facts verifiable through other credible sources? Um, evaluate the overall quality. Is the way, if it's a web page, is it way, well laid out in a logical manner? Do the visuals contribute to the quality? Is it plagiarized from another source or not? Is it cutesy or scary or weird? And are, are there any technical problems with the web page? And again, all this is in the book. Um, and, then we, and then this is, okay, change of topic right here, but it's all on the same form. So I cover both of these things before we pull out the form. Internet search engines. This has nothing to do with evaluating authority, but we're going to get out of here and do an exercise, so I cover this right away. Um, there are different search engines and they do return different results. Be so just because you can't find something in Google doesn't mean it isn't available. So if you're doing a search, try various search engines and try different ones and see what kinds of results you get from them. And there are many more than three, but we, I just have them look at three. So now we're going to stop here and actually I'm going to have you do this too. Uh, pull out the worksheet. Let's see, it must say something like evaluating web sources. Let's see if I can find it. Kind of has a table on it. Looks like this, evaluating web pages. 
and you don't actually have to write anything in here, but I would like for you to look at these two websites that I have them look at and evaluate. So what I have them do is I, this is the same thing front and back mostly. I have them write the name of the, the URL and the name of this web page on one side and the, this web page on the other side. And I have them look at that. So I'd like for you to just go ahead and look at these two web pages. We'll just take a couple minutes to look at them. The person that put this page up, um, well, I think we're done with this part. So um, I'll just continue on because you've had a look at that. And of course, then I did, are, you, are we ready? Then I did MLA format for web pages. And I actually, um, we went over this, and actually in the handout here, I have one page here for MLA format using um, the Viva databases. The, when you find something in one of the Viva databases, uh, how you would write that up. So that one's included, but the rest of these are not because they're in the book. Okay, and so that's the end of that day. So, hey, we're, we're getting there. We'll close this. And I think we're on our last one. Okay, this is week seven. This is it. And so now we're doing chapter five in Taylor, which is organizing the information. And um, also we did PowerPoint this day, and it worked out so well I couldn't believe it because organizing the information in that chapter, they even talk about PowerPoint. So it just turned out to, to work beautifully uh, with um, both books. Organizing the information, they talk about note cards in the book and how you should do note cards. And of course, all the students moaned and groaned, and that's my feeling too, to tell you the truth. Um, they have advantages because they can be sorted, but they are very time consuming to write out. My favorite method of doing this is photocopying all your information when you're organizing your original information. And I do tell them you have to get organized at the beginning. Start organizing while you're doing your research. Don't wait to get organized at the end. I like to photocopy everything I'm going to use in a paper because it's quick and because the notes are in context so you can go back and figure out what in the world's going on. But it is costly, so people who don't have lots of dimes and 15 cents to drop in the copier don't like it. And then you can take your notes electronically using OneNote. And I had just seen a demonstration of OneNote the day before um, I had to do this lecture, and so I wasn't really quite comfortable with it. Um, I hope to learn it better before next time. But it's good for taking notes off of the computer, but I haven't quite figured out how you get notes from books into that. Uh, so I've, I've got to work on OneNote a little bit myself to figure out what's going on. Um, Note taking using photocopies, I said, if you decide to go ahead and do it that way, when you photocopy your uh, articles or whatever it is you're going to use in your paper, don't highlight anything until the end. You can underline with a pencil, but don't highlight until the end. Then um, do your outline for your paper once you've figured out what you're going to say. Do an outline and then take a different colored highlighter and highlight each section of your um, of your, your outline, give each section of your outline a different color, and then highlight your notes that go in each section in that color. And then you can put all your notes in a certain color together, and it works out fairly well. Using OneNote, OneNote is really nice because it's part of Office and so you've got it on the computer already. It usually is just annoying because it says to you, print Printout sent to OneNote, and you say, where'd my printout go? It's stuck in something called OneNote. But um, it really is a lot more than just a printout stealer. It has sticky notes that you can put up there and type on while you're working in other software. It allows for screen captures very easily, so you can take things off the screen and put it in your uh, with your notes for your paper. It has files and folders, so you can put it in a file or a folder. Um, 
and it stores hyperlinks so you can go back to figure out where it was you found information, so that's ni nice. And it works very well with Word because it's part of the Office product. But honestly, I'm not an expert on this and hope to learn a lot more about it before I teach this course again. You should select an organizational strategy for the paper or presentation, and this is in the book too. You can organize by category. It gives you, as an example, if you were presenting information about computers, you'd organize by, um, you might want to talk about the CPU, you might want to talk about then the monitors, the scanners, etc. You can organize hierarchically. Um, in other words, if you were doing a presentation about road work that needed doing, you could talk about the interstates and then uh, other large roads and then neighborhood roads. Organize chronologically by time. Or if you just had things, if you're talking about different types of polar bears, you could, or different types of bears, you could organize alphabetically black bears, brown bears, polar bears, there's really no other way to organize some information. Use correct language and style, and this is it, whether you're writing a paper or doing a PowerPoint dem demonstration. No slang unless it's to make a point. Use appropriate format and proofread, proofread, proofread. Um, use clear, honest graphics. Excel has lots of different types of charts. You can make use of charts in Excel, and you can import those charts into PowerPoint or Word. Oh, and then we get, speaking of PowerPoint, uh, then we get to this uh, part of our demonstration, which is a PowerPoint demonstration. Um, this is what you should not do using PowerPoint. And um, all those things that we just talked about, you should do using PowerPoint, plus there are a lot of other things you should do using PowerPoint. So I'm going to tell you what you should do, and I'm going to show you what you shouldn't do. So when creating PowerPoint slides, follow all of the above guidelines that we just talked about. I think it's faster if I do this. But keep these additional rules in mind. Provide contrast between foreground and background colors. Use legible fonts. This is black adder. This, by the way, on my computer in the library actually is a font. Then I got it here, and it wasn't. So this was a good example for me. Not only do you need to use legible fonts, you also have to make sure that they are available on the computer that you're going to show your Blackboard presentation. This is an example of some fonts that are not so good. Again, this one is one of, actually one of my favorites. It's called Celt, Celtic Wide or something like that. But it's not on this computer, and it is hard to read. So this is an example of what not to do. Follow the six by six rule. No more than six lines per slide, no more than six words per line. And I have heard the four by four rule, and I have heard the seven by seven rule. So I don't really know what the rule is. Must be these are just guidelines, not really rules. Use phrases, not sentences. When you put this much stuff up on a PowerPoint slide, nobody bothers to read it. So put up the important words and just say what it is that you uh, have to say, rather than trying to write it all down. The font size should indicate the importance of the statement. So I've got this backwards. Um, this should be large and this should be small. So you want to make your font size match your points. You should use a simple background, which this is not. Here we go, that Irish music we were warned about. You should keep animation simple. Avoid distracting transitions like this. And avoid distracting sounds. Aren't you glad that's gone? Yes. <laughs> and then be consistent. Use the same theme throughout the presentation, not a different theme on every page like this. Uh, use the same transitions, not different transitions like this. And keep the audience focused on the content <laughs> not the design of the slides. Use only one or two graphics per slide. When you get uh, uh, 
slide full of graphics, it just gets confusing and you can't really tell what it is you're supposed to be looking at. Oh, and that's the end. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> blogs, YouTube, and wikis. Um, a blog is an online journal, and I'm sure you guys know more about it than I do. It stands for weblog. YouTube is a website with a lot of videos posted by anybody. And wikis are websites that allow visitors to add, remove, edit, and change content. And Google Images is a place you can go to get lots of images or pictures. And you can, uh, of course, first you have to make sure you've got the, the large picture. And then you can do, you can right click and do save picture as. So this is where we stopped and we did some things with YouTube and Wikispaces. And so what I want to do in the few minutes we have remaining is to look at my Thomas Nelson Wikispace. Um, one of the topics, one of the final projects they're allowed to do uh, is to do improve a Wikipedia article. And the point is to let them know how Wikispaces work. Um, and so that's why we're going to go to Wikispaces and do this. So let's do that. We'll close out of all this stuff. And now I was, <clears throat> excuse me, I was going to have them actually do, go into the Wikipedia sandbox and mess around in the sandbox, but they close that, clean that sound, sandbox out every 12 hours. And so anything we put in there wasn't there the next day. So it's um, wiki, W-I-K-I-S-P-A-C-E-S dot com wikispaces.com. So I found this place that lets us do something like uh, Wikipedia and it will stay here. So what I'm going to, do I need to sign in? No, I don't need to sign in. Uh, let, me, let me sign in just so I can tell you. Okay, what, actually, what you need to go to is this address, um, http colon slash slash thomasnelson.wikispaces.com. And then in your packet somewhere, there should be some information about Thomas Nelson. And what I'd like for you to do is just, um, and, and of course I do explain how a Wikipedia page is made, how anyone can contribute to the page, edit the page, change it in any way, and um, I don't think people, the students really understand why their teachers don't want them to use Wikipedia until they actually do this exercise and then it dawns on them. So we begin here at Wikispaces, but I do right after this take them to Wikipedia. So let's go to edit this page and then I'll just have you um, go ahead and edit the page. back to visual editor. And when you're finished doing your editing, um, put a note about this edit for the page history log. Fill this in right here so that you'll know that it's you that did the editing. Just put, it doesn't matter what you put there, just put something that you'll know it's you. But go ahead up here and click up here and for example, you can change Lucy Grimes' name because it's spelled wrong both up here and actually on our website at Thomas Nelson. Uh, so just go ahead and add something in there. You could, yeah. Yes. What I just typed, Thomas Nelson served as governor for less than a year. 
Yeah, we, you do need to be back. Okay. Of course, I spelled governor wrong. Um, but then if you go to history, you can see the um, edits that you just did. So uh, it's a tab up there. See, it says home page discussion history. And you can see the edit that you just did. You're, this is me right here. I'm signed on as me. And then these are the ones that you did right here. Respondent? Oh, no, that not that what you put in as your edit? It just says, well, that's, that's what I put in. You put in this one? I put in the Okay, you put in that one, and you put in this one. Okay. You don't get a history tab? Oh, okay, you need to save first. Oh, and then you'll overwrite us. No, this is yours. Oh, okay, that's mine. Okay. All right, now you should have a history tab. Yes, yeah. so you can see, um, you can see how your things are there and how they um, were changed. So that actually is uh, what they do. And then they complain like, oh, you overwrote mine. Well, you overwrote, well, what good is this if anybody can go in there? And so then I go to Wikipedia And, of course, you can go to English and then do a search. And search for Thomas Nelson. Uh, way down here. I don't know why they put it there because it's hard to find. And then you get a list of different Thomas Nelsons. So pick our Thomas Nelson. And here's the Wikipedia article, which, of course, is a lot of students think, well, this is just, you know, God's truth because it's here on Wikipedia. But I say to them, look, you can still go to edit this page and you can still, still make changes. And I tell them, don't, don't make any changes, but you can go there and make changes. It's possible to do and anybody can do it. And if you look at the history page right here, I think this one's pretty interesting. Um, and we scroll down. Let's see if I can find it. These are the people that actually edited this page and changed it. And somewhere down here, okay, this one. This person back on September 27, 2007, wrote, Thomas Nelson Jr. was born on September 26, 2007. He started his career in baseball two days after he was born. Please do not read this information and put it. So obviously somebody was just being funny or trying to make a point, but uh, at least for a while until the person right above him reverted it back, uh, it was completely bogus there. So. Um, we, that's the exercise that we do with Wikipedia. So um, that one, I think, really finally shows them what's going on there. And then let's see if I can take us. We've got four more minutes. Um, and then I go to YouTube. Yes, it's, it's YouTube.com, but you don't have to do this. I'm just going to play this one for you. And then I go to Medieval Help Desk because I think this is tied into information literacy. And this is where we'll end tonight. I'll just play this YouTube for you, and class will be dismissed unless you have any questions. So I'll go ahead and do this one. Where's my large? Okay.
Can you tell that's a book? Let's get a book on death. Right now. Okay, I was going to say we can go in the foyer out here. If you guys need to go longer, we've done it before, so we can go out there. They like it out there anyway. Okay, so. Well, we'll be done really in just two minutes. So. Okay, sorry. So that we started with, you know, medieval times in the book, and then we ended with medieval times in the book here. So um, that that was what we did with the YouTube. So does do you have any questions or any comments or? Question: If we were going to go for this and we were teaching this in class, mm -hmm. would we bring our class to the library like for a presentation or, you know? And, and then I was just wondering if there's any overlap, like maybe with the English classes or maybe orientation, if any, or some of this is covered um, in, in the other classes that are being offered? There is very little covered in the English class. The English class only covers those Viva databases. They come in one time, we do the Viva database thing with them, and they, you know, take that and use it to find papers, you know, research for their papers. Um, Orientation is so strange. It's up to the teacher how long he or she gives us. Some of them will give us a whole hour, and then we can do um, the Library of Congress system and things like that, uh, and our catalog. But some of them only give us 10 minutes. So the students are just rushed in and rushed back out again. So it's very spotty right now how it goes. But the library staff would be glad to work with you. And that's why we would really like for you to email Sharon Cotman and tell her what parts of this you would like for us to um, help with. Because we might set up something formal so that you would know that on a certain uh, section of this that you aren't comfortable with that the library staff would do that. So just let her know um, what part to do. So. They know what's going on. Sharon had a talk with them and they seem to be perfectly okay with it. They, um, well, there was some, I mean, the, the, um, Sharon and Norm were a little worried that it wouldn't go over too well, and and they thought, well, I don't know what. Oop, I got back. Right, but um, my feeling was, yeah, that they would appreciate having students that are so prepared show up in English class. Really, this should be taught before they go to 111. Yes, we're all done. I'm sorry. Yes, you can turn this off now.